you're looking to dive into topics on how to live a happier, healthier, more fit, and long lifespan, then you've come to the right podcast. Living the dream with me, Coach Damian Evans. Together, we will explore the topics on all things health, fitness, and wellness. Together, we will be lifelong learners on this journey to living the ultimate dream. What up, Dream Team? Coach D here coming at you from beautiful, sunny San Diego. In today's episode, we will be continuing on with part two of our breakdown of intermittent fasting. Last episode, we took a deep dive into the history of intermittent fasting, its benefits and its downsides, who it's for and who it might not be for. If you had not listened yet to part one, you're going to want to go back and listen to that episode first so you can be all set up for success and be better positioned to perform what we learn about in today's episode safely and effectively. Today, we are going to go even further and talk about different styles of intermittent fasting, the protocols that the experts suggest when performing specific styles of intermittent fasting, and just as importantly as how to do them, but also how to break them correctly. It is my hope after after listening to part one and two of these fasting episodes, you will be more equipped with the knowledge on not only how to do an intermittent fasting style that works best for you and your health and fitness goals, but also to have a better understanding and relationship with the food that we eat and the whole entire system that is your body and your digestive organs. And also how better to connect to what they need for optimal health. In my opinion, Intermittent fasting should not be done to to just strictly lose weight and then continue on with your current lifestyle once you've lost it. It can be used like that, yes, but I don't think that it should be. This can lead to unhealthy relationships with food. This can lead to pushback and rebound from your body. And doing fasting incorrectly could lead to unfavorable health, health outcomes all around. So as with most things, educating ourselves is key. Researching and exploring what will work best for you is so important. Just because Dwayne The Rock Johnson eats thousands of calories for a treat meal does not mean that you should. Just because Tom Brady has this crazy strict diet and high-tech recovery regimen doesn't mean that it's going to work for you. So listen to the different styles of fasting in this episode. Pick which one that you think will work best for you and your goals. And then, you know it, trial and error. Start slow make small changes, journal, or at least record somewhere, I use my phone, on how you feel and what your results are from whatever you're doing. And slowly over time, you're going to figure out exactly what works best for you, and you'll most likely learn something new about yourself in the process. But before we get to the topic of the day, I want to start by thanking the sponsor of this podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Lululemon. Lululemon has some of the best athletic wear for both females and males, and I pretty much only wear Lulu. Another one of our sponsors is Dirt Food, healing and delicious superfood granola made by hand and made with love by one of my friends here in San Diego, Nika Blunt. She is amazing. She came up with Dirt Food while fighting her two different types of cancer, and she makes it in small batches in her kitchen. Visit eatdirtfood.com and use the discount code DIRTYDAMIAN for 10% off your entire order. Eatdirtfood.com and the discount code is DIRTYDAMIAN, all one word, D-I-R-T-Y-D-A-M-I-E-N, discount code, off your entire order. Get a subscription, get it to your door on a monthly basis. You'll thank me later. And this week's five-star review comes from Havlet6. This has got to be one of my friends, Jen Havlet, who has trained with me for years in the group fitness setting. I know it. Coach D has such a natural talent for sharing information that makes it feel personalized. All the information has been so valuable for making healthy shifts that are achievable. I highly recommend this podcast for anyone at any level of fitness to learn more about a wide variety of topics. That's amazing. Thank you, Jen. And for the listeners, Jen is a true testament of what small changes compounded over time can do. Her fitness journey includes losing an incredible amount of body fat, increasing her strength, increasing her productivity and happiness at work, and has even got her entire family focused on health. She's got her little boys asking about health, which is awesome, doing it together. I'm so extremely proud of you, Jen, for all of your continued hard and consistent work, and I'm so happy to be a part of your fitness journey. 
If everyone else would do me a favor, if you haven't already, while you're listening to this episode, if you haven't subscribed, please take a second to subscribe to this podcast. You might have to research it on whatever platform you're on and hit that subscribe button. This is going to allow you to get notifications every time I drop an episode, and it also shows people that this podcast is worth a listen to them and their network. Also, you could scroll down and leave me a five-star review if you feel that I've earned it. I really read every single one, and I appreciate and love the feedback. And now on to the topic of the day. All right, part two, intermittent fasting, a complete how-to guide on different styles. So continuing on from last week's episode, let's just jump right into the different styles of intermittent fasting. Different styles of intermittent fasting and their benefits and downsides. There's going to be several approaches to intermittent fasting. For fasting to be safe and effective, it must be combined with balanced meals that provide good nutrition afterwards. It's going to be so important to stay hydrated and know your physical limits while you're fasting. Right now, if you ask the average person, what, is, what does intermittent fasting mean to you? They're going to probably describe to you what is actually referred to as daily time-restricted feeding. And the easiest style of this version of fasting is to extend the fast that simply lasts through your usual nighttime fast. So a daily cycle of 16 hours followed by an eating window of eight hours. That's usually sustainable for most people. An example would be if you stopped eating around 8 p.m. and then you didn't eat again until noon the next day. So that gives you from noon to 8 to eat an eight-hour eating window. That's, re- that's pretty tangible for the average person. Some people actually extend this window to 18 hours fasted and six hours of eating or even more extreme 20-hour fasted window and only four hours to get your meals in. I even follow this elderly professor who says that he does five days out of the week. He only eats for a two-hour eating window from 4 to 6 p.m. Uh, I can only imagine that he needs to be really dialed in with the types of foods that he's eating and his supplementation of his micronutrients. But he actually looks great. His cognitive ability is above average, and he moves and acts like someone much younger than himself. So apparently he found something that really works well for him. Whatever you give your yourself as an eating window here, whether it's eight hours, six hours, or two hours, what you're doing is daily time-restricted feeding. So for me, the way that my lifestyle is set up, I actually eat a little later than most people because I get home from coaching. I usually get home and I eat around 10, 9 or 10 p.m. Um, and then my first meal of the next day is around 1 or 2 p.m. I'll eat something like when I get done breaking my fast, I'll eat something like a turkey sandwich with Greek yogurt and mixed nuts, maybe some jerky or cheese thrown in there. That meal holds me over until the last meal of the night. Uh, If I get hungry, I'll usually snack on something around 5 p.m. And then my second and last meal will be usually around 8.30 or 9 p.m. Pretty late, but that's just when I get home from work. So that's where it works best for me. Then I'll eat some really good quality meat at home for night nighttime. I can't recommend enough butcher box meat. Butcher box. I'm probably like 74% butcher box with how much that I consume. They're a great company. Super good customer service. Highest quality meat that you're going to find. And it gets delivered to your door on a subscription that you get to choose. So you get to choose which types of animal products that you'd like to be spending. You get a certain amount of credits, and you can just allocate those credits to whatever you want to get. Definitely check out ButcherBox if you're an omnivore, of course. They usually have really good specials going on. Like when I signed up for my subscription, they said, you get free bacon for life. Yeah, that's right. You heard me. Every box that I order, we get of free bacon thrown in there. Oh my gosh, free bacon for life. It's like those words are so nice. I'm not affiliated with Butcher Box at all, but I'm going to include the link to their website in the description and if if you decide to get a subscription, just let me know. I'm pretty sure I can find you a discount code that's going to get you either a um add-on meat, a special or it can get you a discount. So, let's break down what they call a 16-8 intermittent fasting ratio f- just for the beginners out there, 16-8, 16-hour fasting window and eight-hour eating window. Fasting is pretty simple, but a lot of people try to overcomplicate it by digging really deep into the science. For most of us, it's not going to be necessary to go that deep. 
So let's start with the fasting portion. I'm going to walk you through step-by-step example. So if you're planning on doing this, go ahead right now would be a good time to grab something and take some notes. In this example, let's say we stop eating at 7 p.m. at night. This is going to be the start of your fast, 7 p.m. Now, I know 7 p.m. sounds kind of early for some of us, especially me, and maybe that's not where you want to start. For me, I don't get home till about 9 p.m., so I definitely need to fuel my body after coaching, so I couldn't do this. But if your goal is fat loss and you get home at a normal time, a lot of the experts agree that stopping earlier, more towards the 7 p.m. mark, aligns more beneficially with your metabolic and environmental clocks. Again, this is just an example. Just do what works best for you. So after you've had a full night's rest, you stopped eating at 7 p.m. the night before, I recommend in the morning just having a large glass of water. The only time that you wouldn't do this is if you're doing a dry fast with no liquids, but we're not going to go there. We're going to assume that this is not a dry fast. After you've gotten your inner bath down in the morning, 12 to 24 ounces of water or more, whatever you want, here's a little hack that I found as I was researching. Drink some apple cider vinegar, and if you have it, Drink it with some turmeric or ginger or a little bit of cayenne pepper. Any of those will work, or you could do all of them. If you don't have all of those things, it's okay. Apple cider vinegar by itself will do. Why are we doing this, you ask? Well, this guy that I follow on YouTube, he's a fasting expert. His name is Thomas DeLauer, and I'll talk about him a lot in this episode. He says that apple cider vinegar will kick you into a fasted state a little bit faster. So it's a great way to start your day to kickstart some of those metabolic processes along with all the other benefits that apple cider, apple cider vinegar offers. And remember, you don't have to drink this little concoction. It's just a lot of people that I'm coming across while researching are saying that it's a good extra booster. Essentially, it's extra credit. So just take that. Um, Now, during your morning period, it is definitely okay for you to have coffee or even tea. However, at this point in the game, it has to be black coffee. It has to be a low calorie to no calorie tea. No sweeteners, no creamers, possibly some stevia or monk fruit if you have to have those artificial sweeteners, but that's up to you. Some arguments say that it does break your fast. Some arguments say that it doesn't. The science is still a little, they're working on it. Now, if you're struggling with energy and you're looking for energy, but you don't want to drink this coffee or you don't want to drink your normal Starbucks, don't go with the Starbucks. I, I can I can't recommend enough this supplemental caffeine pill that I've been taking for years, maybe even a decade. I tell everyone about it. It offers me great energy and I never have a crash like I do from pre-workout powders. The brand is Allmax, A-L-L space M-A-X. Allmax is the brand. It comes in like this little blue bottle, costs like five dollars for a hundred of these two hundred milligram pills. So 100 servings of 200 milligrams. 200 milligrams is is a little bit more than a cup of coffee, actually, depending on what you're getting. Just don't buy all of them on Amazon because I'm going to be really upset when I try to re-up. I'm going to include the link to this All Max caffeine pill in the description of this episode. If you're interested, it could save you thousands of dollars a year if you use them right. I'm just saying, this is what I do for personal training clients that say that they don't have money for personal training. We actually take the money that they use from coffee, buy these pills instead, and then they pay with their personal training or their group fitness membership with the money that they saved from not drinking Starbucks every day. Also, it's okay that you're not going to be eating after your workout as well. Most people think that you have to eat right after a workout. There was a study done where it talked about this 30-minute anabolic window where you had to eat in order to get the results from the workout. At least this is how people interpreted the study. The study was actually for people looking to build muscle after getting their body fat down. So if you're at your desired body fat percentage and looking for strength and muscle gains, then yes, you'll want to consume some protein and carbs post-workout. But remember, we're talking about fasting here. So you need to decide what is most important for your goals right now. Is it the benefits from your fast or is it to continue building? However, if your goal is fat loss, which I'm guessing a lot of you listeners are at this spot in your life right now, go ahead and do your workout fasted and continue fasting after. It may be challenging for the first couple of times that you do it, but it does get easier. So you don't have to eat right after your workout. 
yes, there are some benefits, but if it means you're breaking your fast early, then that's not really where you're at right now. Don't break your fast if you've decided to do a fast. Get your workout in. Strength training is what I recommend. Throw in some full body compound lifts like squats or deadlifts or pull-ups, or if you're not at a pull-up point yet, lat pull-downs. You could do lunges or bent over rows. Just pick some of the larger lifts that hit more than one muscle group. This is what you're looking for. And then if you do want to do some cardio training, save that and hit it at the very end of your workout. This is a great strategy to build muscle, which will only amplify and supercharge your your weight of fat loss. Now let's talk about the post-workout. Once you've completed your workout, what are some things that you can consume that won't break your fast? Approved drinks from the experts include, obviously, water. Water would be my recommendation just to be safe and because of all the other benefits that water offers that we've discussed about in the past. But also experts say tea and coffee. Again, these two drinks and their caffeine content offer what is called, here's a super fancy word, phosphodiaterase inhibitors phosphodiaterase inhibitors. All that that means is it allows your body to accumulate some of the stuff that triggers your body to burn more fat. Caffeine is a fat mobilizer. So your green tea or your black coffee would be a good choice if you can handle that amount of caffeine. You can sip on mineral water as well that has no calories in it. Herbal tea does work, even though it does have little pieces of fruit floating in there. It's negligible with how it affects your fast, as long as you don't go overboard, of course. Any zero-calorie beverage is technically okay, but I would err on the side of caution if you're looking at this zero-calorie, let's say, diet soda or energy drink. I don't know. I just wouldn't go there if it was me, but technically zero calorie is supposed to have zero, zero calories in it. So technically, yes, it doesn't affect your fast. I would just stick with water or coffee or tea if it was me. I know some of you are going to be wondering about artificial sweeteners. All I know about artificial sweeteners is that there is a huge giant debate and battle going on between the experts. There is definitely an argument on both sides if artificial sweet sweeteners are okay to consume for overall health and then for definitely the fasting purposes. Some say that they are fine, and scientifically they are most likely correct in the short term because of the studies that we've done so far, but we don't have any really long-term studies when it comes to artificial sweeteners. Some say that the behavior of eating artificial sweeteners is accompanied with they're super detrimental to your psychology towards your fat loss goals and your relationships with food. Again, this would be your choice here. Do what works best for you. Next, supplements that you might want to consider taking during your period of fasting. Magnesium, potassium, sodium, like your electrolytes. LMNT is a great uh, company. Uh, The actual letters, L-M-N-T, I think that they actually are called Element. Um, They make a great supplement that I take that has um, electrolytes. So check them out, LMNT.com. I'll put a link in the description of this episode. Uh, creatine. We've already talked about this before, except my recommendation was usually around five grams of creatine for muscle building effects. When you're on a fast, two to three milligrams of creatine will be sufficient for your needs. So five milligrams when you're looking to build muscle and you're actually on your eating game, and but drop it down to two to three grams of creatine per day. This will be sufficient when you're fasting. Um, this is going to help with your energy because because creatine helps create ATP in your body and your brain. So definitely utilize this supplement. Cheap, effective, safe, studied heavily, look into creatine. Lastly, also look into tyrosine. Tyrosine is T-Y-R-O-S-I-N-E. It's a precursor to dopamine, so it's been suggested to help with cravings while fasting. So check it out. If you're um, someone that gets cravings really bad, maybe research tyrosine and, and, of course, lots of water and movement. Overall, a few electrolytes to balance out your underconsumption of calories and your water slash electrolyte loss throughout the night of sleeping and sweating and breathing. That should do, should do you just fine. Next, we're going to talk about some enhancers. So let's say that you've been doing this 16 and 8 intermittent fasting for a few weeks and you're just absolutely loving it. Let's say you're wanting more out of it. Well, expert 
uh, Thomas DeLauer on YouTube. He suggests a few additions here. If you're looking to boost your fasting benefits, we touched on these a little bit with your morning concoction. Turmeric, ginger, cayenne, pepper, and sage have boosting effects. Cayenne pepper has a thermogenic effect and also has some effects on the vagus nerve. That means that a large part of the fat burning that happens from fasting isn't just because you're not consuming calories. When you're fasting, your body is its sort of in a shock, in a semi-fight-or-flight mode. Well, cayenne pepper puts you into an even more fight-or-flight sympathetic state. This is done in an effort to give you more energy. Now, sage, thyme, rosemary, oregano, sage, thyme, rosemary, oregano, all have powerful effects on gene expression. You won't need to know this, but specifically what is called PGC1-alpha and also PPAR-alpha. Don't worry about knowing these things, but just in case you want to do a little more research for yourself, it does, these things do have effects on gene expression. Remember, we're keeping it fairly simple for this episode, so I'm not even going to go any farther into that. Sage, thyme, rosemary, oregano. Other approved or non-approved items that you consume on your fast include, well, let's say for the sake of this beginner program, gum is going to be okay. However, it is important that to tell you that many do express greater feelings of hunger when they consume gum. If you're someone that struggles with cravings during fasting, it's probably recommended that you stay away from gum. It'll most likely enhance your feelings of hunger. Something weird that I found out when researching is that toothpaste, toothpaste actually has an ingredient in it that creates a metabolic effect. I had no idea, meaning this could break a person's fast if somehow you ingested too much toothpaste. Does this mean you shouldn't brush your teeth? Hell no. Brush your teeth. That's nasty if you don't. <laughs> However, just make sure that you rinse and you spit out all the toothpaste and just have the awareness of what it could do if you left too much in your mouth. Another thing is MCT oil. MCT oil is highly thermogenic. It does help you burn a little more fat, but MCT oil is also something that holds caloric value, so it's going to break your fast. If I'm, I mean, I'm someone that loves to put MCT oil in my black coffee in the morning with some ghee butter, and I blend it all together. However, if I'm going to do a fast, I'm going to hold the MCT oil and the butter that morning. Thomas DeLauer suggests that anything under 5 calories is fine to consume on a fast, so things like gum and herbal tea or ginger— the reason is, is that amount of calories, five or less, is really not significant enough to really affect the benefits of the fast. And usually the things like herbal tea or ginger offer things to help enhance the benefits of your fast. So usually a good rule of thumb is five calories or less is probably all good. Some side effects that you might feel from fasting include hypoglycemia, sleeplessness, fatigue, or constipation or diarrhea. With hypoglycemia, when it comes to fasting, they did some studies where they see that people are actually kind of creating their own view of this hypoglycemia in themselves. Because they are thinking that they do need food, it seems that a lot of these feelings of hypoglycemia tend to be more on the psychological side. Yes, super interesting. So as you adjust to eating less, you'll definitely have different feelings of energy or fatigue that you're not used to. Same thing with the digestive processes, right? You're going to notice that you do need time to adjust when you change your normal eating routine. So just be ready for that to happen. So we're getting close to the end of your fast. Prior to breaking your fast, here's some hacks to consider. A little bit of cinnamon because cinnamon has been found to lower cortisol. So when you bring in some food, you'll have less likelihood of a certain enzyme triggering the food that you consume to get stored as fat. So a quarter teaspoon of cinnamon a half hour before you break your fast has been shown to help not store the food you're about to eat as fat. Very interesting. Mr. DeLauer also is associated with a company called Peak Tea, P-I-Q-U-E, Peak Tea, which is T-E-A-T-E-A, and he recommends checking out some of their teas. They have some nice herbal ones, some black ones, and they even have a cinnamon one that he really likes. He has a discount code, and it's Thomas, T-H-O-M-A-S, and you get 5% off of all their tea. 
Peak, T-P-I-Q-U-E-T-E-A. Check them out. I've never used them, but this guy's the expert, and he seems to really like it. Uh, moving on to the next hack for what to consume. Next is bone broth. We're going to talk about this again, but it's definitely optional. But what bone broth does is it helps draw water into your intestinal tract, making it so that you can utilize more of the nutrients that you're consuming without potential gut distress. Also, a little bit of salt 30 minutes prior to breaking your fast can help stabilize electrolyte levels before you bring food in. So next, we're going to move into your eating period. So all of that just now for the 16-8 window was all about during your fasting window. Now let's go more towards your eating period. Your fast is done. So here's how you're going to break your fast. You break your fast with lean poultry, lean fish, or a protein shake. Now be careful here with the protein shake because if you consume a whey-based protein shake, some say that you can have a little bit of an inflammatory response. Some people get it. And plant-based proteins have been found to not have this response. So if you're wanting to avoid the possibility of an inflammatory response, then maybe go with the plant-based option. I myself, I'm not affected by whey protein out of a fast, but some people have, a, have reported a negative response for whey. So just be aware of that. So back to the lean poultry and fish. Because that type of meat is going to be higher in what's called thiamine, T-H-I-A-M-I-N-E. Lean poultry or fish has a higher content of thiamine, which helps you. This is going to help you out with your met metabolizing of glucose, your blood sugar. It's not recommended to eat beef right out of a fast. And that is mostly because saturated fat right out of fast is actually pretty hard on the digestive system. I myself, I am a huge beef eater. I do love beef from ButcherBox, but definitely gear more towards the leaner meats after a fast. Much of the benefits that we are after when we fast is to control inflammation and to modulate our current inflammation. So eating beef right out of the gate is probably not what you want here. Also, interestingly enough, vegetables are hard on the gut right out of the fast. So while vegetables are pretty well regarded as amazing and healthy, just kind of leave them out when you break your fast. Try to keep your first meal lower in carbohydrates. If you do need a little bit of sugar, some experts say that you should just stick with fructose, which is, or the more natural sugar from things like honey or whole fruits, because those have been found to bring a slightly lower insulin response. Remember, we're trying not to create a, a bunch of blood sugar spikes because then when we release a lot of insulin to help with that blood sugar spike, I mean, that's one of the things that we're trying to avoid by going and doing this fast in the first place. So lean meats, protein, and lower carb if you can. This first little bit of food that you eat right out of your fast should only be about 20% of your daily caloric intake. So it's not a very big meal, a very small meal. Also, supplementing with some B vitamins like B12 has helped control energy levels because adding food and taking away food and doing anything that is not what you normally do can definitely have an effect on your energy levels. Check out bee pollen as well. Bee pollen, yeah, it's a new pretty popular thing to consume for these reasons. If you want some of the best quality honey and bee pollen out there, I order from beekeepersnaturals.com, beekeepersnaturals, all one word, dot com. I mean, I buy their royal jelly honey and their bee pollen, and then when I coach, I have a, a nonstop supply of their throat spray because it really helps to protect my vocal cords from all the yelling that I do. So beekeepersnaturals.com, and I use Sean Stevenson's discount code from the Model Health Show. The discount code is MODEL, M-O-D-E-L. You can get a pretty good discount with his discount code. Then 30 to 90 minutes later, after you break your fast with, with your small bit of lean meat or whatever it is that you consumed, experts recommend that this is where you're going to want to eat your larger meal and with more diversity. This is where you can really have your steak, your red meat, your ground beef. You can be a little more flexible with this meal. You're gonna wanna have some soluble fiber with this meal. So think chia or flax seed. You can Google soluble fiber foods and see what you would like here. The reason is those fibers actually break down into chemicals 
that send signals to our brain to help our metabolism. Now, depending on what type of diet that you're on, quote unquote diet, you're going to want to include different macronutrient breakdowns in this meal. So let's say you're doing keto. This meal that is 30 to 9 minutes after your first little bit of food, you're going to want to eat higher fat here if you're on keto. Go to town. Eat your fats. Dark chocolate that's unsweetened, the butter, the ghee. But if you're eating carbs and you're not doing keto, then this is your time to bring in the bulk of your carbs. 40% of your calories from the entire day should come from this meal. So you break your fast, you eat a little bit of lean meat right after, and then 30 to 90 minutes after that, this is your big meal. 40% of your daily calories, this is the bigger meal of the day. Also, you're not going to want to really snack throughout this the day that you're fasting. Keep your eating pretty fairly clean. Remember, you're doing this for a lot more reasons than just to lose weight. So for your lunch and your dinner, the day after breaking your fast, you're going to want to skew your macros a little bit more towards the protein. Even if you are keto, less fat here and more protein. Taper your calories as you go. So as you're eating a couple more meals after your big 30 to 90 minute breaking your fast meal, you should be eating less and less calories per meal as you move throughout your day. The last meal of the day should be easier to digest. So the last meal of your day, think something like Mediterranean style, like a nice fatty fish with a good omega-3 profile, along with those herbs that we talked about earlier, oregano, thyme, rosemary, sage. These all have genetic activators in them to help you get more out of your next fast. You'll also want to eat lots of veggies at this meal, your last meal. These will also help kickstart your next fast. So think Mediterranean. You can search online and find many different dishes that fit the Mediterranean diet if you're not quite sure what I'm talking about here. And then remember, you're going to be doing this probably multiple days, maybe multiple days in a row, just depending on how you do this. So make sure you give yourself a hard stop time of eating. Experts suggest slowly making your way to that 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. hard strict stop time condensing your eating window from, let's say, noon to 7 or 8 p.m. This is what your goal is to hit one day. You're going to get much more benefits from your fast if you stop eating around 7 p.m. and you give your body uh, a couple hours of no food before you go to bed. Some supplements you can have in the evening after you've eaten your last meal of the day are CoQ10. CoQ10 helps to manufacture energy, so your body knows how to utilize the food better. Also, krill, algal, or calamarine fish oil. Essentially, these are just higher quality fish oils. Krill oil, algal oil, or calamarine oil. And this is just to make sure that you get enough omega-3 in your diet because, of course, it's going to be really tough to get everything that you need in your diet when you're fasting. And then, of course, magnesium, because we're already deficient in magnesium as a society. 400 to 500 milligrams of magnesium is recommended, as well as some probiotics, which is going to help with your gut biodiversity. So that right there was a pretty simple breakdown of how to attack a standard 16-8 ratio hour time restricted eating fast. You can use the things that we talked about just now as you go through the different styles of that we're about to talk about as well. So the things that we just did, you can kind of input these into the next few styles, just depending on what we're doing. So let's talk about what other styles of fasting there are along with that daily time restricted eating window that we just talked about. The next style of fasting, which is a little bit more true to the term intermittent fasting, this is what we call alternate day fasting alternate day fasting. So instead of doing a 16, eight hour fast every day with alternate day fasting, you do a slightly longer and more aggressive fast every other day. So let's just go through a week. Monday, maybe you're going to fast all day and eat a very small dinner. And then on Tuesday, you won't, you're going to fast. You're not going to fast at all. So Monday, you, you just had a very small dinner. Tuesday, you didn't eat at all. And then Wednesday, you're going to fast and have a super light dinner again. So just like Monday, 
you didn't eat all of Tuesday, but you're going to have a nice little light dinner on Wednesday. Now, on the days that you do eat, you're going to eat ad libitum, which means that you're going to eat as you desire. Some people are more strict on that rule, but the evidence shows that you can be very flexible on your eating days as long as you are strict on your non-eating and fasting days. If you're interested in this style of fasting, I'm going to include a nice 10-minute YouTube video from, again, the fasting expert Thomas DeLauer, and he breaks down more in depth the science behind alternate day fasting, as well as giving you a couple of sample days that you can follow. So find the link in the description of this episode. Um, from this video, he also shares that there are some studies that show people who do alternate day fasting actually lost more body fat, actually seven pounds more than those who just did the time-restricted uh, eating window that we just talked about. Super interesting. The study concluded that members not only adhered to this alternate day fasting better, they followed it better than the time-restricted eating window, but they also preserved their muscle mass better. It seems to be a lot easier to stick to a fasting for a full day and then have more freedom on the days that you don't that you do eat. It's easier to really just turn the switch on or off for most people. It's easier than trying to control your eating window and trying to taper your calories throughout the day. So if you're like the study subjects and more of an all or nothing type personality, this might be a great style to look into. He also discussed something that is super interesting as well, and that is that the subjects from these studies actually reported being less hungry the longer they went into the fast. So essentially, the longer a person fasts, the less the person felt the uncomfortable cravings or hunger signals. That is so weird to me. The longer you don't eat, the less the cravings happen. This highlights that a lot of our hunger throughout the day and our cravings throughout our normal days has a lot to do with our own psychology. I mean, the brain is a powerful thing here, we, more than we know. So check out that link if you want to learn more on alternate day fasting. All right, moving on to the next style, periodic prolonged fasting. Now, this is any kind of fast that it's a little bit longer than the normal time-restricted eating window that most people consider, quote-unquote, intermittent fasting. We're talking about a fasted time frame of 24 to 48 hours or more. A long time to not eat for most of us. This has a little less effect on body composition benefits, so like fat loss, and a little bit more focus on cellular regeneration benefits. Of course, you're also getting a ton of psychological benefits when it comes to depriving yourself of the normal overconsumption of easily accessible foods. When we normally can have whatever we want at the swipe of your touchscreen, and in a world where we can get it easily with instant gratification, there are some serious benefits of strengthening your willpower and following through with something that is actually quite difficult in today's advanced eating society. Believe it or not, the longer you go into a fast, the more you will find mental acuity sharpens. You actually get sharper as you fast longer. But the physiological body composition effects tend to start to diminish at about after about 24 to 48 hours. So if you're going off of my suggestions here, don't do more than a 48-hour fast unless you have specific goals that you're trying to obtain. Perhaps it is cellular autophagy, which we discussed in part one of this masterclass. Or perhaps you'll find that your attachment to food is becoming unhealthy and you want to prove to yourself that you are able to conquer your inner struggles that way through detachment or maybe or maybe even for like spirit, spirituality reasons. Those are all great re reasons to move forward with longer duration prolonged fast. But if you're simply trying to lose body fat, this is most definitely not the strategy of style of fasting that I would recommend. Prolonged fasting should be reserved for once a quarter or maybe once a month at most. Also, important to note that coming out of these types of fasts require you to be a little bit more careful, a little bit more gentle, and a little smarter with how you break your fast. Other styles of fasting include liquid fasts. You still consume coffee, bone broth, maybe bulletproof coffee. You can still consume calories, but everything is consumed in liquid form. Technically, you could drink a soda on a liquid fast, but 
You know how I feel about sodas, so we're not even going to go there. This type of fast is mostly done for digestive health and giving your digestive organs an opportunity to get a break from the constant effort of breaking down nonstop boluses of food all day long. There are a ton of videos and information on the internet that go over liquid fasting, and you'll hear tons of people talking about juice cleanses or liquid detoxes. But make sure you do your research on what you're doing because most of these companies are just taking advantage of a popular health trend, packaging it up real nice and marketing it and selling it at absurd costs to you. Make sure you have your real reasons as to the why you're doing a cleanse or a detox or a fast or whatever you want to call it. Really have a strong purpose as to why you're doing it. And that will help guide you into whatever strategy and however you're going to do it. These liquid fasts should not be done for fat loss goals, in my opinion. You're losing some of the key ingredients in the food when they are juiced, and you're still at risk of putting tons of calories into your body if you're not careful. Again, liquid fasts should be done with your digestive health and digestive organs being your main concern. I personally am not a huge supporter of juice cleanses, but then again, I have had some members that have had huge successes with them and have not had, I had nothing but good things to say about them. So again, do what works best for you and do your research and trial and error experiments on yourself that we always talk about. Now on the converse side of liquid fasting is dry fasting. This is where you don't consume anything, no food, no water anything. Dry fasting is extreme. You should not do dry fasting any more than once every three to six months or so. Honestly, what ends up happening when you dry fast is you end up pulling hydrogen from your fat stores to make what is called molecular water. Basically, this means that your body burns more fat because it has to take a portion of your fat to make water. Yes, literally fat contains hydrogen, which means that the hydrogen in the fat can combine with the oxygen that you breathe to make what is called molecular water. So yes, dry fasting has been shown to be effective at fat burning. However, I personally think that this is quite an aggressive strategy to get your fat loss goals. And I couldn't find any studies or information on this, but I know that the more aggressive you tend to push the body, the more aggressively it wants to push back. So if you're going to dry, do a dry fast, I would definitely say don't do this style any more than two, maybe three times a year at most. As much as I harp on the benefits of water, this wouldn't be my first choice of a fast. But I also know that the body responds from stresses and bounces back more resilient from stresses if you do it correctly. So I don't know, there could be something with the strategy if you do it right. One more time, I just want to drive home how important it is just how important it is on how you break your fast. The steps that you take coming out of a fast are super important, and the longer the fast was, the more important your food choices will become. You're going to want to avoid certain foods, and you're going to want to prioritize certain foods. The fast must be broken slowly. Overeating after a fast, especially of unhealthy foods, this has to be avoided. Focus on real whole foods. That's what the body needs. That's what it wants, and that's what it deserves. When you go grocery shopping, make sure that the quality of your protein that you're going to get is top of the line. Organic or pasture-raised meat or wild-caught fish. Healthy fats are crucial for building healthy hormones and, and also really important for satiety, which is helping you be more full. Focus on foods like avocados, coconut oil, grass-fed butter, and nuts. Unprocessed carbohydrates. Consume foods like low-glycemic berries. Green leafy veggies, squash, quinoa, sweet potatoes. Avoid the bread, the pasta, the candy, and other processed refined sugars. Limit your sugar and limit your alcohol. These can offset all the good things that you're doing. Also, definitely keep yourself well hydrated. Your body will be begging for water when it's deprived of the nutrients that it's used to receiving. Now, some of the people that I follow on intermittent fasting propose that when coming out of a fast, the first thing that you should do is to take care of your insides first. You're going to have a hard time getting in shape and feeling healthy if you don't take care of your organs. So when you break a fast, it really helps to use bone broth. 
Four to six ounces of bone broth does a really good job of allowing the collagen in the bone broth to help restore the gut. When you fast, a lot of times you end up temporarily weakening your inner gut mucosal layer. This layer is supposed to protect you from acidic damage and other stress and damage to the gut. So yes, bone broth, super important. And then after that, it's important that you're not combining fats with carbs. Here's the reason. Carbs will cause insulin to spike. When insulin is present, it unlocks the cells of the body, the cells of the body and the cells will open. The cells are now more receptive to uptake whatever it is that you're consuming. So if you consume carbs, that triggers insulin, the cells open. Let's say you consume carbs and fats. Well, guess what? The carbs or the, the glucose, the blood sugar, yeah, that's going to go into the cells, but guess what else does? So does the fat. If you consume carbs by themselves, just the carbs go in. So that is that is what it is. But if you consume fat by itself, fat doesn't even trigger the insulin response. So you're not getting the cells to open. So avoiding consuming carbs and fats together. You could do carbs. You could do carbs and protein. Or you could do fat and protein. Or even whatever. Just not carbs and fats together. Remember, lower carb to start. If you're going to do carbs, fructose, natural honey, whole fruits, usually the way to go when it comes to your carb situation right after your fast. There is also a small thing that I want to note here when it comes to the difference in fasting for men and women. There are a lot of crazy bro science philosophies out there, but don't pay attention to a lot of them. Reality is men and women are pretty similar when it comes down to how the metabolism works with fasting. Duh, there are definitely differences, but not huge ones here. The only thing that women really would want to consider and be a little concerned or aware of is that because of their rep reproductive organs and system, females tend to experience hunger signals a little bit more aggressively than males. So for a strictly survival and evolutionary standpoint, it's a little more, let's call it quote unquote dangerous for lack of a better word for a female to be deprived of nutrients and energy when they're planning to be able to carry and grow and give birth to a child. So the female bodies are found to go into a little bit more of a, a fighting response. It might send hunger signals up through the roof and make you super hungry. So if you're a female, just be aware that this may be something you might encounter. And even though the benefits of fasting really don't start until about 16 hours, of fasting, you can get some effects. You definitely can get some effects by fasting for a shorter period of time. Maybe start with just 12, 12 hours of fasting or 14 hours of fasting and work your way up till you get to that 16, eight, a little bit slower. For men, it's a little easier to jump into a full on fast because of the different hunger hormone signals. Yes, ladies, I know it's not fair. Men have that but guess what? When y'all go to Vegas, you get free drinks and you get free club cover charges. So I'm over here paying $50 to get into a dang pool party or, or paying $30 for these three foot tall slushy drinks. So can we call it even? I don't know. I digress. Anyways, <laughs> actionable items for intermittent fasting. I watched a great TED talk given by Dr. Cynthia Thurlow. She's a Western medicine trained nurse practitioner and a functional nutritionist who is passionate about the female hormonal health. She says that she recommends her female clients start on a 12, 13 hour fast on the first day. So something like they would stop their eating at 8 p.m. and their next meal wouldn't be until about 8 or 9 a.m. the next morning. That's not too bad. That's super easy. If you can curb your late night snacking, that's totally doable. Then every day or two, increase your fasting window by one hour. So you're decreasing your eating window by one hour every day or two. Her clients would do this every day or two until they hit a 16 hour fasted window and eight hour eating window. She recommends keeping yourself really well hydrated and you can also pl have plain coffee or tea first thing in the morning and it won't break your fast. In addition, Dr. Thurlow says that you should give it a solid 30 days before you determine if this is good for you or not. 30 days is enough time for you to see the benefits. If you stop early, then it's going to be harder for you to know what's really happening, especially if you've never fasted before. And if you have any chronic health conditions, she definitely recommends that you discuss with your health provider before you do anything for the first time. 
she wants to be clear that it could take up to six to eight weeks to really start to reap in the benefits that intermittent, intermittent fasting does have to offer. Interesting. Another factor that most people don't really think about is when should you work out? Should you work out when you're fasting or should you wait until after you fast? Now, there are a few theories here. If you want to get the benefit of fat burning, then working out during your fast has been shown to have some huge benefits. Most people who do time-restricted fasting do it throughout the night. So let's say they stop eating, for me, 10 p.m., and you don't have your first meal until 1 or 2 p.m. the next day. There are going to be different strategies I want to talk about here. So the first strategy is to do your workout right when you wake up. So if you got a good night's sleep in the morning, that would be the right in the middle of your fast, maybe eight or nine hours in, depending on how much good sleep that you got. The other strategy is to wait until the very end of your fast. So rather than doing it in the middle of your fast, right when you wake up, you could push your workout back later in the day, right before you eat your first meal and your, your break, break fast. Uh, let's say that's around noon or one. You work out right before the end of your fast. There's going to be some benefits and downsides to both of these strategies. If you do your workout first thing in the morning, yes, you are technically in the middle of your fast. And you can still reap some of the fat burning benefits, but you'll have much more energy for your workout fueled by some of the food that you consumed the day before. If you wait all the way until right before you end your fast, so all the way near the end of, let's say, your 16 hours, you're going to reap the maximal fat burning benefits due to the body being deprived of energy throughout the full period of fasting time. The downside, however is that you're going to lack much more energy at the end of your fast as opposed to the middle of your fast. So the intensity of your workout may suffer. So this is where you just have to know yourself and what your goals are and how you will feel. All of that has to come into play. What are you looking for? More energy for your higher intensity performance or more fat burning approach with less fuel? If you're someone that can push through energy deprivation and really attack your depleted energy stores to fuel fat loss, and that's your main goal, then great, do that. Attack those workouts at the very end of your fast. But if you're looking for more health benefits and, and of fasting and less fat loss, but you really want to maintain your beast mode in the gym, then maybe you do it first thing in the morning, which would technically be mid-fast. And then, of course, if you want to wait to work out until after you've been fed, so for example, if you end your fast at 2 p.m. and you work out at like 4 or 5, then you'll notice some huge strength and performance increases with your fresh fuel in the body. You will have or miss out on all those fat-burning benefits that come from exercising and or training in a fasted state. If you do decide to work out that after you've eaten, just make sure that you want to digest your food first. As soon as you break your fast and you eat food, a lot of the blood goes to your gut and your digestive and internal organs in order to help digest and metabolize the food you just ate. If you are to work out, you are then detracting the blood from your organs out to your extremities, which takes away from the body's effectiveness to absorb the nutrients from the food that you just ate. Along with perhaps even experiencing some intestinal distress from eating too close to physical activity. All, uh, of course, depending on what types of foods you ate, of course. Just remember, you'll have great strength gains, but not quite as good of a body composition effect. A study in the Journal of Physiology stated that when you work out fasted, you burn significantly more fat. The reason is because you have little pieces of fat inside your muscle. This is called intramyocellular lipids, intramyocellular lipids. These intramyocellular lipids get evacuated out of the muscle when you work out in a fasted state. So they leave the muscle and they go into the bloodstream and the body uses them for fuel. The body takes the little bits of fat that are in the muscle, puts them into the bloodstream and burns them. And then the process repeats. So fasting and working out is really, a, it's a powerful way to kind of hack the system a little bit and get a little bit more fat burning out of your fast. Now, there is also a big concern with those looking for fat loss goals and or health goals, but understand the important role that muscle plays in overall quality of life. One of the biggest concerns about fasting is that you will lose the precious muscle tissue 
which we all know that the loss of lean muscle mass, what kind of detrimental effects that could have on our weight loss, as well as our longevity and health span. However, a study published in the Journal of Translational Medicine provided that intermittent fasting versus not intermittent fasting, but eating the same amount of calories ended up in the subjects not only burning more fat, but also building more muscle. Literally eating the same kinds of foods, same calories, and same macronutrients, proteins, fats, and carbs. Just one group had a specific shortened window, and the other group had an entire day to eat their meals. They found that the subjects were able to reap the benefits of intermittent fasting while maintaining their precious, precious muscle mass. That's awesome. So don't worry, you're not going to lose muscle. Most of the time, most people will be depleted their fat stores without breaking down muscle tissue. Anyways, yes, if you fast for three, four, five days straight, then you're for sure going to start to eat away at your muscle. But if you're just doing time-restricted eating, or even if you go 24 or 48 hours, you can probably rest assured that your muscle is going to be fairly safe. And one of the biggest questions people ask to a point where it's kind of like a running joke for most nutrition experts is the question, will blank break my fast? It's pretty simple. If it has calories, it's going to most likely technically break your fast. However, to what extent? And does it really matter to you? Those are two things that you should really ask yourself. Like we discussed earlier, black coffee and tea, those are completely fine and you'll still reap almost all the benefits that fasting has to offer. If you're doing fasting for fat loss purposes, of course, if you're doing it for detachment reasons, then the whole point is to detach. So maybe in that situation, you're going to be a little more strict with yourself. Also consider supplements. If the supplement has calories, sugars, carbs, amino acids, it technically breaks your fast. Stay away from supplements that are in soft gels as well. Soft gel tablets like vitamin D or fish oil or vitamin E, those all have calories. They're the same thing as if you're using cooking oils like olive oil or coconut oil. Just wait until after your fast and after you've eaten to take those types of supplements. And lastly, I get asked all the time about alcohol. Oh, alcohol during a fast. Now, alcohol is a little tricky. When alcohol is consumed and broken down in the body, it gets broken down into, I'm probably going to butcher this word here, but it's called acetaldehyde, which is very toxic to our body. We all know that alcohol can be hard on the body, but what ends up happening is because the acetaldehyde is so toxic, it jumps ahead of all the other foods inside your body. So what that means is that your body still has a metabolic effect and it's going to prioritize alcohol over everything else. But one thing that is important to know is that fat processing occurs in the liver. If your liver isn't doing well, you're not going to burn fat very well. So if you're asking a lot of your liver to prioritize acetaldehyde or however you say it from alcohol and ethanol, then you're slowly slowing down the process of burning fat. So alcohol will definitely break a fast, but I highly recommend if you're going to consume alcohol that you do it after you absorb some of your food. So go ahead and break your fast and then a couple hours later, you can consume your alcohol. Remember, I'm not a nutrition expert. I have a bachelor's degree from Oregon State University in exercise and nutrition. However, that was a long time ago and the science has evolved. So in fact, this field of nutrition is one that frustrates me the most and is a huge reason why I started recording this podcast in the first place. I am just sharing things that I learned along my research journey that may or may not help you understand a little bit better about your own body. It is still your responsibility to explore what works and what doesn't work for you. You are the only one that is like you, and you are the only one that will ever be like you. What works for the large majority of the population may have the complete opposite reaction for you. Rule number one, do what works for you. Rule number two, it is going to take time through trial and error, right? Have fun exploring how unique you and your body are and how unique you and your health needs really are. Let me know if I can assist you in any way. And if you have any information that I missed, any questions that I did not address, or just comments and feedback on the topic of intermittent fasting, make sure you comment and shoot me a message. All right, Dream Team, that's it for today. 
please share with me any knowledge, thoughts, or questions you may have on today's topic. I'll make sure to answer and discuss on the next episode. You can ask your questions in the comments section or message me on any of the social media platforms. Also, I would be so thankful if you shared this episode with any of your friends or family that may be able to benefit from today's podcast. I would love it if you could do me a solid and screenshot this podcast and share it on your social media platforms and just write one takeaway, one aha moment that you got from this episode. This will help me know what's really valuable to you and so I can keep the good information coming. And it also lets your network know if this podcast is worth a listen to them. Thank you so much for listening and learning here with us on the Live in the Dream podcast. We are so grateful for you being a part of this lifelong learning journey. If you have any topics you'd like to discuss, please let us know in the comments or by messaging me on Instagram at CoachDamian underscore SD. Be kind to someone today. Smile at someone today and leave every person you come into contact with better than before. Until next time, friends, keep living the dream.